All right, welcome everybody to the third presentation in our Winter Water Talks 2023-24 uh, series. We have one more coming up next month. I'm Paul Skowinski, the statewide educator for the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network, and I'm joined here by Emily Heald from the Water Action Volunteers. And today we are welcoming Mike Miller, a stream ecologist with the Wisconsin DNR, to talk about an overview of key factors that affect stream and river health. So before I turn it over to Mike, a couple of quick reminders. If you haven't joined the Water Talks before, these webinars are all recorded and posted to the Extension Lakes or Water Action Volunteers YouTube channels. So you can find this webinar and any of our previous ones from this year or earlier years and view those again or share them with others. And if you have questions today during the webinar, please put those into the chat box within Zoom. You can put the questions into the chat box anytime during the webinar, but we will be holding most of those until the end. We just want to make sure that Mike can get through all of his material first, and then we can address the questions with the remainder of the time that we have. Uh, last thing is please make sure your microphones and cameras are turned off just to make sure things can go as smoothly and quietly as possible today. So at this point, Mike, I'll hand it over to you. You can go ahead and bring up your slides and take it away. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks again, Paul. So as Paul mentioned, I'm a stream ecologist. I work for uh, the Department of Natural Resources in Madison. Much of the work I, I do pertains to statewide surveys of streams and rivers. I work a lot with the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, a study I'm conducting right now is looking at the effect of a certain type of insecticide in our streams and rivers called neonic uh, neonicotinoids. I'm going to focus on that uh, for a little bit just because I think it's a uh, issue of emerging concern. Uh, so what you're seeing on the slide here, what I'm holding up is a model sculpin. Uh, there, there's four different species of sculpins in the state, two live in uh, streams and rivers, the model sculpin we're seeing here and a, a slimy sculpin, and there's two that live in the Great Lakes. So uh, there are key links in the food chain. Uh, a trophy sculpin is about three and a half, maybe four inches long. Uh, you, those large fins you're seeing, they're called the pectoral fins, and they uh, hold them out in the water. And again, they're living in a flowing environment. And so the water flowing over the top of those large fins presses the fish down onto the stream bed. If you had a, if you were fishing, you had to swim 24 seven for your entire life, you probably wouldn't do very well as far as you, uh, as far as, uh, as far as growth or reproduction is concerned. So again, they rely on camouflage since they're not strong swimmers and also these big pectoral fins to hold them on the river bottom. So there's uh, three things I wanted to cover uh, this afternoon. One, I want to talk about leg legacy impacts to our aquatic resources, primarily streams and rivers. Again, things that humans did perhaps well over 100 years ago that still affect our streams today. Then I'll get into you know what are the major factors that uh, determine what kind of streams we have and their, their uh, conditions. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about natural factors, whether it's uh, bedrock geology or topography, whatever, and then also spend a fair amount of time talking about uh, the impacts we have on our watersheds and how that affects our aquatic resources. And lastly, I'll touch on uh, very briefly some uh, best management practices that we can do on the landscape. Uh, in Wisconsin, about a little over 30% of the land use in the state is for agriculture. So that's a key audience that we need to have engaging in best management practices. And my definition of a best management practice is the person that uh, implements the practice benefits as does their uh, natural resources. So you know, talking about streams and rivers, you know, where do they fit in the uh, water budget of the planet? All of you are uh, quite familiar, I suspect that, uh, you know, roughly 97% of the water on planet Earth is saline, for, you know, in our oceans, and then 3% is freshwater. Perhaps less uh, known to some of this audience is that if you look at that 3%, how does that break down as far as proportions, you know, where is it found? Again, you can see here that uh, roughly 69% of that water is tied up in our polar ice caps and in glaciers. And, you know, unfortunately, we're changing that part of the uh, distribution fairly rapidly, but you can see the breakdown among the different water compartments for fresh water, again, that 3%. And then, you know, you can, as you can see here, roughly uh, three tenths of 1% of that fresh water is surface water on the planet. Uh, 
And again, if we look at that bottom pie chart, you can see how that is distributed among lakes, wetlands, and streams and rivers. Again, the point being is that roughly two thousandths of 1% of the Earth's water budget is actually uh, found in streams and rivers. So, you know, relatively small proportion of the planet's water budget. Uh, but then if you kind of tie it back to Wisconsin, so, uh, we think we have about 22,000 individual streams in the state, and that equates to about 42,000 miles of uh, flowing water perennial streams. If we also included intermittent and ephemeral streams, again, that maybe only flow during uh, certain times of year, you could uh, double that number to about 84,000 miles. But again, if we took that uh, 42,000 miles of perennial streams and you know, straighten each stream out, stream out and line them up end to end, we could encompass planet Earth roughly 1.6 times. So again, lots of stream miles in the state of Wisconsin. So this idea of legacy impacts. Well, I think we lost your audio there. Uh, actually, I was just giving you guys a moment to read that. Sorry. Oh, should, okay. <laughs> should, have, should have invited you. So hopefully you've now read the quote here by Seth Meek. So Seth was a naturalist and he spent most of his life in Illinois and Iowa, but he occasionally wandered up into Wisconsin making observations about the natural world. But uh, the point here with this quote is that, you know, well over a hundred years ago, people are starting to make the link between uh, human population growth and changes in land use and what effects they're having on our aquatic environments. Uh, you know, the sad uh, commentary and all this is that uh, it seems like it's a seemingly a lesson that needs to be relearned by each subsequent generation, particularly our legislators. Uh, so again, looking at some of these legacy impacts, uh, at about the end of the uh, Civil War, railroad lines are established in the northwestern and northern Wisconsin, and that really accelerated the movement of people uh, into the north and northwest, and that, again, accelerated the deforestation of the pineries of the north and some of the hardwood forests of uh, northwestern Wisconsin. So again, this started in earnest roughly in about the 1860s, and then in a kind of a blink of a geologic eye time, uh, you know, roughly 50 years later, this is what much of the northern Wisconsin landscape looked like. So. In, you know, it doesn't take much to imagine this altered uh, uh, environment, uh, the watersheds that our aquatic resources uh, are influenced by. Uh, so uh, uh, photograph the Chippewa River, this particular log jam was thought to be about uh, five miles long. So again, uh, many of the loggers that uh, migrated to the northern Wisconsin were from the uh, uh, Northern uh, Europe, uh, Finland, and uh, Sweden, et cetera. And, and kind of in their spare time, they built these big wooden glaciers and they had a real tremendous impact on our rivers where again, the grinding forces uh, of these log dries really widened and shell, uh, resulted in very shallow water in many of our rivers. So, and it still affects them to, uh, to date. And so the Department of Natural Resources and, and others go in and uh, narrow up these river channels uh, because of the impacts from, again, well over 100 years ago. Uh, so, we, you know, we cut down the upland forest, we plot up the prairies, uh, the, many of our uh, watersheds lost their capacity to hold the soil in place. This photograph is from uh, Coon Valley in western Wisconsin. Uh, you can see here the, someone sitting on a horseback just for scale, like you can see the amount of erosion taking place in western Wisconsin. Actually, the first soil conservation project in the country was started in Coon Valley, owing to these perfect soil problems. It's not just, wasn't just isolated in that particular valley, but um, much of Western Wisconsin was impacted by uh, these erosion problems. So I want to move on to, you know, what are some of the major factors that affect our, our streams and rivers? And I'll touch on some inherent natural factors, but then also uh, discuss human uh, induced factors as well. Uh, certainly bedrock Bedrock geology has a strong influence on uh, particularly the hydrology of our streams and rivers. Uh, some uh, factors here, uh, igneous rock and metamorphic rock in particular, they have very little pore space or low porosity. So uh, the ability for these uh, bedrock types, uh, their ability to hold water is very poor. So you know, if you look at a distribution of high capacity wells in the state, you'll see very few in north central Wisconsin. It's not 
because there's not a desire to pump quantities of water, but the bedrock there just has a, a very poor storage capacity. Again, it's shale or, or granitic rocks and uh, the only real poor space or space for water in those types of rock structures are cracks among the rocks. Uh, and if you can contrast that with say the kind of U-shaped area of uh, sedimentary rocks and more to the southern part of the state, uh, things like sandstone and uh, uh, limestone have very high porosity, roughly 30% of the that type of bedrock is pore space so it can hold a tremendous amount of water. And that all influence the hydrologic cycles of our streams and rivers. Uh, this issue of groundwater movement, again, water can move maybe a millimeter or two a day uh, in some bedrock types or upwards of hundreds, if not thousands of feet per day. Uh, if it's something like uh, a karst, uh, topog or karst geology, for those of you that live in uh, East Central Wisconsin, uh, as example, you're uh, kind of well aware, particularly in areas around Brown County or Kiwani County, where we have thin soils or these karst rock formations where there's a uh, uh, great amount of water moving because of the open space within those areas and the uh, rock dissolves over time because it's uh, the calcium carbonate it is, gets dissolved by uh, acidic water. And so it creates these you know, cavernous movements uh, uh, through the uh, uh, rock structure. And lastly, uh, the mineral content can affect the productivity of our streams and rivers. We talk about soft water streams in North Central part of the state. Again, those types of rocks, the shale and granite uh, uh, don't dissolve readily. And, uh, and you contrast that with uh, again, southern Wisconsin, where there's sandstone and limestone, where, again, the water passing through those porous materials picks up a lot of mineral content, such things as calcium carbonate, and those are building blocks for our streams. The carbon is a key energy source, and the carbonate is used for the exoskeletons of our aquatic invertebrates. And thinking about the surficial deposits of soil, they too have uh, strong influences again. It can influence the infiltration uh, rate of water. So, is the water going to infiltrate into the ground and enter the aquifer? Is it going to run off uh, into our streams and lakes and wetlands? Uh, and other things, uh, again, soil types can influence the nutrient content of the water that may be percolating into the ground or running off the surface. And things like erodibility, of course, are influenced by the soil types. And then uh, particle size as well. And I'll just use the examples of, uh, say, in the uh, east central part of the state, uh, you know, again, Kiwani County, uh, Brown County, et cetera, that, that red area are clay soils. And you see the same types of soil types up in the Bayfield area. So even prior to arrival of Europeans to the upper Midwest, these streams likely had relatively highly turbid waters. Again, the clay soils are pretty tight. They inhibit water infiltration and it promotes surface runoff. And with that runoff, our clay particles and, and being very fine, they tend to be uh, suspended in the water for quite some time. So again, soil types has an inherent strong influence on the conditions of our streams and rivers, independent of human activities. Uh, and then <clears throat> what uh, hydrologists come up with is what they call base flow index. So when we talk about base flow, it's again, the contribution of groundwater to our surface waters, whether it's a wetland or lake or stream. Uh, so again, depending on these, uh, rock formations, the bedrock geology and the soil, uh, those act in concert to affect how much water in our streams and rivers comes from, you know, cold, clean groundwater sources versus perhaps warmer and likely more polluted surface runoff. Another factor, in addition to geology, is the topographic uh, uh, landscape itself. Uh, again, you can see this uh, land formation map of Wisconsin. All you're well aware of the driftless area and the fact that it was not impacted by the most recent glacier. Uh, so it had you know, roughly uh, about 30,000 more years to, for the streams and rivers in that area to cut down through that bedrock geology. So we have much more steeper topography. Again, the water in that part of the state, when, when there's a rainfall event or snow melt, again, the water will infiltrate on the uh, valley sides or, or the uh, tops of the valleys and uh, via gravity gets drawn down into the valley bottoms and that water then expresses itself uh, in the streams and the valley bottoms. And the same thing with, uh, you can see up here in the northern part of the state when the glaciers receded, uh, they had these lateral moraines that left a lot of glacial till, so very porous. 
uh, rock, whether it's you know, sand, gravel, cobble, that sort of thing. So it uh, really promotes the infiltration of water and also to influence the, uh, the topography of the state. Again, the glaciers overall had a much a very strong flattening effect on the state, but uh, when they receded, they left this glacial till or drift uh, on the uh, surface of the landscape. So it altered the, the uh, topography and, and also the hydrography of uh, Wisconsin. What I'm going to do now is overlay a, a map of uh, some of the larger cold water streams, again, streams that are dominated by uh, base flow coming uh, from the ground. So can you can see uh, directly how the topography and geology influences the distribution of cold water streams, uh, you know, our trout streams versus perhaps our uh, warmer, uh, you know, cool water and warm water streams. So again, uh, the uh, water type temperatures and flow regimes, uh, mineral content, all strongly influenced by uh, bedrock geology and these surface, you know, topographic relief impacts. Again, those types of factors, again, water temperature and uh, mineral content of the water, et cetera, strongly influence the biota of our streams. And, and to note here that uh, many people think, well, uh, Southeast or South Central Wisconsin doesn't have many trout streams. And that's probably because there's so much agriculture and urban development. And that's not the case for, you know, frankly, if we could go back 200 years, you know, prior to European development, uh, there'd be relatively few uh, trout waters in this part of the state, again, owing to the uh, low topographic relief, the uh, tight clay soils uh, and lack of glacial till. So again, we have these inherent factors that affect the distribution of the uh, uh, types of aquatic animals we might find in our streams and rivers. Uh, so this is just a, a classification regression tree. So uh, I get, not to get bogged down in some gory statistics here, but you know you might want you might think you know what drives the influence, what influences the distribution of uh, fish in the state? Are they all all the species uniformly you know, found across the state? Uh, again, not really. So we use these types of uh, statistical tools to kind of separate. Uh, uh, the apples uh, from the oranges type example here. So again, if you took the 115 or so fish species that live in our streams and rivers, what uh, determines where they live in the state? Are they, are, again, are they found uniformly across the state or are they uh, found in certain areas and, and why is that? And what we've learned over the years is the fact that uh, water temperature is the most important factor driving fish distributions in the state and elsewhere. So water temperature, <clears throat> again, once it gets about, above about 74 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, it, it's too warm for many of these fish species like trout, uh, whether it's a brown trout or a uh, brook trout or some of the lamprey species or the sculpin we saw earlier, whereas other fish are you know, called warm water species because they can persist in higher water temperatures. And then the next major factor is frankly, just the size of the stream or river itself. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, some fish, you think of a sturgeon or a paddlefish and some of these larger species, you know, one, they need, need just more space to live in, but again, also using the paddlefish as, as an example, it's a, it feeds on plankton. So plankton tends not to persist in small streams. So again, they're relegated to larger river systems like the Wisconsin uh, primarily and the Chippewa and others. And same thing holds true for sturgeon that uh, need a amount of, a significant amount of volume for, uh, for them to persist. So Again, in this state, if you're wondering what drives fish distributions, it's temperature first and then water body size. And I don't have it on this plot, I don't think, but uh, stream gradient can be thought of as like the next uh, kind of third major factor. So, <clears throat> so we talked about this river continuum concept. The most cited paper in all of aquatic ecology was called the river continuum concept. And it's a paper by Ra Robin Van Oet and others published in 1980. It's been cited thousands of times. Again, a very important concept. And that, that concept is, and you can read that he, here. So you can all appreciate that, you know, streams change, you know, from their headwaters to their mouth, they get bigger, they uh, get wider, more volume, maybe more sunlight impinging upon the stream itself versus a small shaded stream. So we're, that's affecting the temperature. We might have more nutrients as we flow farther down into the watershed. So the, the point is if uh, some of these inherent physical factors strongly influence the uh, biological uh, 
uh, characteristics of our streams and rivers. Also note, and it, you know, probably most of you are well aware of this, but our, our uh, streams, uh, the drainage patterns in our watersheds are very tree-like or dendritic. And so we have a lot of little headwater streams kind of analogous to the twigs of a stream, and then fewer larger branches and limbs, and then a main stem. So again, uh, if you look at that, uh, what's called a mirrored bar chart off to the right, Again, on this side, these bars show the percent of the total number of streams in the state that are of different sizes. So we use a term called Strahler stream order. So these headwater streams are called first order streams. When two first orders join together, they become a second order. When a second order and a first order join, still remains a second order. So the point is we've got you know, over half of our streams in the state are these little twigs, these little headwater streams, and a much smaller proportion are these larger systems and something like the Wisconsin River is where it uh, flows into the Mississippi River is about an eighth order uh, stream or river, I should say, and uh, that holds true of the Chippewa and a few other large river systems in the state. And the uh, Mississippi River by Prairie Sheen, I believe, is a ninth order. By the time it flows into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, it's a 10th order stream. But as you can see here, those small streams are short in length in general. Uh, so if we look at the sheer mileage, again, uh, what proportion of these different stream sizes make up the total mileage in the state? So in these small streams are, you know, very numerous, but they're a little bit shorter, but they still take up the kind of the bulk of our streams are these uh, smaller streams. And again, less so uh, of the larger river systems. So again, just case in point of a first order stream. So this is a, a photograph from the Driftless area. Uh, it's uh, Pierce Hill Road Creek. Uh, so again, the water infiltrates on the upland hilltops and the valley sides, and then it flows down because of gravity underground, and then it uh, expresses itself in the valley bottoms. So you can't really see it in this photograph very clearly, but the stream actually starts right about here and meanders around. It's outlined by these marsh marigolds and tussocks. Uh, so again, a, uh, a cold water environment, uh, there's a lot of shading, uh, not a lot of in-stream productivity, uh, relatively harsh environment for most fish species. So there's maybe one or two pioneer species that can live in these types of shallow water environments. Uh, but then you can, you know, as we flow farther downstream, uh, that stream we just looked at flows into Coon Creek. And at this point, this is a fifth order stream. And at least in the state of Wisconsin, roughly at about fifth order, the streams become what we call non weightable. So at least when biologists or ecologists are sampling these water bodies, we end up using boats versus uh, trying to wade in to collect fishery data or aquatic insects or whatever. Uh, so, you know, preaching to the choir here, but again, what we do on the landscape has real profound effects on the quality of our surface waters. So use this conceptual model as getting at uh, in, in my uh, description of my presentation. So again, uh, in these conceptual models are you know, a simplification uh, of our understanding of the environment. In this case, I'm using the term stream integrity. So what affects the health of our streams? So when I'm looking at a watershed, if I'm doing a study on a stream, these are the things that uh, are come to mind when I'm trying to understand what's impacting the stream. What do we need to do to improve the quality of this stream? And what I'm going to do is go through each one of these uh, five determinants individually and recognize that each one of these determinants is strongly influenced by what we do on the landscape. So talking about water quality, as you're well aware, prior to the arrival of Europeans in the upper Midwest, uh, the landscape was covered with uh, depending how far back we go in geologic time, perhaps prairies or forests or oak savannas, that sort of thing. And then our European ancestors uh, or the Europeans arrived to the upper Midwest and they brought with them the skills and the desires to rapidly modify the landscape. So we alter the landscape and we certainly strongly alter the uh, characteristics of our water resources as well. Uh, edge of a crop field uh, after a rainstorm event, edge of a cornfield, you can see, you know, water was flowing off site and you can see the remnants of the soil that was moving off site. Uh, yeah, our row cropping uh, in the state and elsewhere uh, tends to deliver more, greater amounts of sediment and nutrients and agrochemicals for that matter to our surface water. So this map shows that darker green colors are indicative of watersheds with higher proportions of row cropping and things like field corn or, or soybeans, those sorts of things. So not surprising in these watersheds, we tend to have uh, more frequent problems with uh, sedimentation or eutrophication. So again, knowing 
uh, where these cropping practices are taking place can uh, be very helpful in describing the condition of our aquatic resources. Uh, so the Onion River, nothing unique about the Onion River really. Again, it's in uh, Sheboygan County, so east central Wisconsin. It's an area that we saw on the map where there's heavy clay soil. So after rainstorm events, uh, water flows off the land because it's uh, more difficult to infiltrate into the aquifer uh, and it carries with it these fine clay particles. So, you know, 200 years ago, this stream would flow clear year round. Now we see it's very turbid during the cropping season. And that has a number of effects. One, it, it reduces the uh, depth to which sunlight can penetrate or the photic zone, uh, the uh, standing of the water, the darkening of the water uh, increases solar heating of the water. Uh, again, the plants that historically lived on this stream bed a couple hundred years ago no longer persist in the, uh, because of this turbidity issue. And so a number of different uh, kind of cascading factors that affect the health of the Onion River and hundreds of streams like it in the state because of soil runoff and, and nutrients from our uh, croplands. Uh, so from a biological perspective, just one example here with the walleye, which is a visual predator with increasing water turbidity, these fish are not going to be as efficient at chasing down their, their prey items, minnows or whatever. So going to increase water turbidity, we tend to select against certain fish and other species. Uh, so this is not your average size dump truck, but the ones you see out on the roadways, they hold about, they can hold about 10 tons of topsoil. Many of our crop fields in the state are losing more than 10 tons of topsoil per acre per year. Now, not all that soil is going to end up on a nearby lake stream or uh, river, but it's uh, or wetland, but, but it's on this downslope march to the low spots on the landscape. And that uh, obviously is, is where the water resources are at. So then uh, some a study done by the USGS here in Madison, uh, they estimated that uh, in a hundred square mile watershed, we're losing about you know two and a half dump trucks of sediment per day. Uh, and again, that can affect the turbidity, as I mentioned, it delivers nutrients, phosphorus is particulate associated. So it, when the soil particles move into the water, so does the phosphorus. The suspended particles in the water can scour aquatic plants and animals that live there. And uh, a major factor is sedimentation, filling in the coarse substrates on the stream bed with fine silts and sands. And so some of the studies that I've involved with the US EPA, we estimate that, uh, you know, frankly, half of the streams in the US are strongly impacted by sedimentation and the fact that there's excess amounts of sediment on the stream and riverbeds. And again, that can smother the aquatic life that uh, should be living there. So I'm not a big sports fan, but Camp Randall Stadium in, in Madison, uh, you can uh, just read the, the uh, facts or the information at the top of the screen here. So we got uh, you know 1.2 million uh, dairy cows in the state and a, you know, a little fun fact that on average, one dairy cow produces 125 pounds of manure a day, one cow 125 pounds of manure per day. Again, so I'm not talking about chickens or beef cattle or hogs or sheep or goats or turkeys or ducks, or whatever, just the uh, dairy cows in the state produce enough manure to fill Camp Randall Stadium every four months. So the next time you're at a Badger game and things are a little bit slow, you can reflect on this fun fact. And then we do surveys, whether it's at the state scale or national scale, we find that a, a majority of our waters have excess amounts of uh, nutrients, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus. And again, that can have significant effects on the uh, stream biota. Uh, this, so this plot, this extrusion plot showing uh, livestock densities in the state of Wisconsin. So not surprisingly where we see high livestock densities, it's often uh, areas where we're gonna run into water quality problems because of uh, excess nutrients. So a trend line looks, would appear I need to update my data here, but a trend line of phosphorus in uh, on average uh, soil concentration of phosphorus in our crop fields. And again, you can see, well, I should point out that arrow, that double uh, ended arrow, that green arrow uh, represents the range of phosphorus needed for optimal plant growth. So the point in this graphic is we have more phosphorus in our crop fields on average than what's needed for optimal plant growth. So we need to be smarter about our nutrient management plans. Uh, so again, this idea that uh, we have, you know, agricultural runoff is, is a big problem in this state. So again, fish species. So this picture is of a, a brook trout. It's our only true native 
uh, inland trout species in Wisconsin. The brown trout came to us from Europe, uh, whether it's the UK or Germany or the rainbow trout, which uh, naturally are found uh, on the west slope of the Rocky Mountains. But again, in general, or uh, brook trout are very environmentally sensitive. They need cold, clean water, clean uh, substrates to spawn on. So when we have impacts because of poor land management, we see a loss of these species. And oftentimes they're replaced by more tolerant species of uh, common carp being one example of, again, they can, on a per weight basis, a trout uses six times more oxygen than a carp does. Again, carp can live in very warm water. They're omnivorous. They can feed on many different things. Uh, they're not visual predators or sight feeders. So it, it's not an issue to uh, persist in turbid waters. And a, a large female carp, like we see in this photograph, can release up to 2 million eggs per year. Uh, you know, our urban landscapes are uh, tough environments for our streams and rivers as well uh, for a number of different reasons. And I'll touch on some of these, but again, this map showing the human density in the state can give us some ideas where uh, our urban streams are at, of course, and, and those that are likely impacted by uh, impervious surfaces and other factors that affect stream and river health. Uh, so again, we've got issues with cropland runoff, but when we have these impervious surfaces in our uh, urban watersheds, uh, most of the water that uh, hits the surface of the land does not infiltrate, but runs off into our storm drains. And those storm drains, many people don't recognize this, but they flow directly into our surface water. So many people think, well, it, uh, storm water is going to storm drain, it's going to the wastewater treatment plant, it's going to get uh, taken care of at the wastewater treatment plant. So and it doesn't matter if I let my leaves wash into the storm drain or I had a little bit of uh, fertilizer left from my lawn. If, you know, if it ended up in the street, that's not a big deal. But again, it's a direct conduit uh, to our surface waters. Uh, you know, Wisconsin being an egg state, we use lots of uh, pesticides. So we didn't get much uh, snow in Madison this year. Well, actually, this photograph was taken in uh, June. Uh, this is a hexagenia mayfly hatch on the uh, Mississippi River. And so that's what that looks like uh, more close up. Uh, uh, again, these animals, they live in a soft sediment as larvae for two or three years, and uh, they emerge as winged adults. They have a very brief adult lifespan. They find a mate. The female retain, uh, returns to the a river or lake and lays its eggs and, and completes its life cycle. Uh, so what you see here is, uh, well, you, so you can see the border, that squiggly line is the border between Minnesota and Wisconsin, the Mississippi River. And what we're seeing here is a, a NOAA weather radar station out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, and it's detecting a hexagenia mayfly hatch on the uh, Mississippi River. Billions and billions of these mayflies hatch out over the course of three, four weeks from late June into early to mid July. Again, a key food source for many of the animals that uh, live along you know, this part of the uh, upper Midwest. And what we're seeing, there's been some recent studies showing major declines in the emergence of the hexagenia mayflies, not only in the Mississippi River, but also in uh, Western Lake Erie as examples. So it's been kind of a uh, region-wide phenomenon. And uh, so we're currently conducting some studies that try to determine, is it because of change in, in river flow in the Mississippi River or the fact that we have these invasive uh, zebra mussels or other uh, invasive species, or is it because of uh, pesticides? And that's a study I'm working on right now at, on inland streams. So I'm going to devote a few minutes to that because I think it's an uh, a issue of significant concern. So where have all the in insects gone? Back in the battle days, farmers, truck drivers, others would uh, take a window screening and they'd put it in fr the front of their grills of their radiators of their cars and trucks so they wouldn't get plugged up with uh, insects. Uh, we don't seem to have that problem anymore. Uh, and some people say, well, it's because our, our trucks and cars are much more aerodynamic and th no doubt there's something to that. But I personally drive a 30-year-old <clears throat> Uh, Volvo, uh, 240 Volvo, uh, those owners affectionately refer to them as Swedish bricks. Uh, so my my Volvo is about as aerodynamic as a chest freezer. So when I drive out, say, to the Driftless area to go trout fishing, uh, I actually get excited when I get like one insect strike on my windshield because uh, it's such a rare phenomenon these days. So what's causing these declines in insects? And I'll, one of the culprits that I want to touch on is insecticides. 
and again, it's a, a, a global phenomenon we're seeing, uh, and, and these trend lines are, are for primarily for terrestrial species, but we're seeing both within uh, aquatic environments <clears throat> and terrestrial environments a loss in many of the insects. And I don't need to tell any of you that they're the base of the food chain and fundamentally important. <clears throat> so one of the uh, chemicals of concern, insecticide, uh, are called neonicotinoids, and I'll probably use the term neonix uh, through, for the rest of the talk, but uh, again, they're found naturally in various plants uh, in the Sol Solanaceae family, again, kind of disparate group, you know, tobacco and tomatoes and potatoes as example, but again, they naturally produce these chemicals that kill some of the pests uh, that feed on them. In this case, you're seeing the underside of a soybean leaf with aphids, which are a, a sucking pest <clears throat> that uh, suck the phloem or, or fluid out of the leaves. Uh, but chemical manufacturers have now uh, 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 synthesized those chemicals. And this is, you know, uh, some of you have not heard of neonics, but I suspect all of you have heard of colony collapse in honeybees. And one of the concerns there is these neonic insecticides. Uh, just to give you a feel for how toxic these chemicals are, uh, a lethal dose in a, a test population of of uh, 50 uh, or of test organisms, uh, where 50% of the test organisms die. So it's called a LD50 test is five nanograms per bee. So five billionths with a bee, of uh, uh, one gram of neonics is enough to uh, kill a, a honeybee. And to, to continue that analogy, if you took a, a granule, uh, a sugar granule's worth of neonics, that's enough to kill 125,000 honeybees. And they're also, these chemicals are very toxic to aquatic invertebrates as well. So it's not just an issue with honeybees or pollinators. Uh, so I see my slides are on kind of autopilot here. So what I'm going to show you right now is uh, imidacloprid is one of these neonic chemicals. There's like three there prim primarily used in the U.S., but they became commercially available in uh, 1993. And this is the use patterns we saw back in 2000 and then moving on to 2005, moving on to 2010. Again, the darker the color, the higher the application rates of the neonics, uh, moving on to 2015. And then in 2014, 2015, uh, the chemical manufacturers uh, took advantage of a loophole in EPA's tracking of insecticides and other pesticides. Uh, it's called the treated, treated articles clause, where uh, again, the primary use in the upper Midwest and the US probably and globally is treating seeds with neonics and other uh, pesticides and other chemicals. So again, the fact that they're applying, applying them to the seeds uh, EPA says you no longer need to track these. So we saw these dramatic upward trends in the use of these chemicals and the neonics are the most widely used insecticide globally. But at this point, we have no tracking data to see how much that's increasing across the U.S. Uh, so I, I'm currently doing a study looking at uh, uh, the concentrations of neonics found in our streams. And uh, just to kind of quickly walk through you through this. So again, based on laboratory studies, we know that at certain concentrations, neonics are either chronically toxic to aquatic life or, or acutely toxic. So it may impact their behavior or feeding or growth or reproduction. So that'd be a, a chronic effect and an acute effect is obviously a mortality. So that histogram on the uh, left, and I'll just uh, have you focus on just the statewide F, uh, estimate, but based on the studies I'm doing right now, I, uh, I offer this estimate that upwards about 17% 17 of the streams and rivers in Wisconsin have neonic concentrations that are at levels that could chronically impact aquatic life, primarily aquatic insects. And if you look at uh, the bar chart on the right, uh, again, the Instagram there just for the statewide estimate is that you know upwards of maybe seven percent. And again, to be honest, these error bars are uh, these estimates are pretty loose at this point. And we're going to need to tighten that up. But point is, we have pretty strong evidence that these insecticides are having uh, major effects across Wisconsin. And these other breakdowns, I looked at watersheds like in the Central Sands, we produce a lot of potatoes and carrots and peas and sweet corn, etc with heavier application weight rates. So, you know, we see much higher concentration of neonics and uh, many more of those streams are likely impacted by uh, neonics than say the statewide average. And then the you know, same thing with like our corn and soybeans. Again, these chemicals are applied to the seeds prior to planting and they can have 
and you can't even buy field corn in the state anymore that are not treated with these chemicals. So even if a farmer did not want to use these chemicals, they're hard pressed to find a seed source where, uh, where uh, again, where these chemicals weren't already applied to the seed. Uh, so that's a little uh, disturbing. And a real kicker in all this is there's a, a, a great study done by Grout et al. in 2020 at Cornell University. It's like a 400 page report sitting on my desk. But what they looked at was, uh, Okay, so we certainly know that the streams and rivers are not benefiting from these chemicals. So what about the ag producers? And based on studies of uh, looking at field trials, again, hundreds of trials, multiple states, a couple of Canadian provinces, their study concluded that in 83% of these tests, field trials, that there was not an increase in crop yields. And, uh, and similarly for soybeans, again, hundreds of field trials, multiple states, multiple provinces, a uh, very strong preponderance of evidence saying, okay, these uh, seed treatments of neonics on corn and soybean have little or no benefits to the egg producers. And again, they also found it for those uh, producers that did see an increase in crop yields, oftentimes those yields are pretty modest and about 40% of the time uh, for those uh, uh, tests where there was an increase in crop yield, there wasn't enough increase in the crop yield to offset the cost of the chemicals. So, you know, the, the question is, Again, the aquatic resources aren't benefiting from it, and, and frankly, the entire food chain, uh, both terrestrially and aquatically, uh, and apparently the uh, ag producers aren't benef benefiting from it. So who is? So it just, to me, it's kind of mind boggling that uh, uh, this is going on. So kind of my mis mission for the next year or two is to talk to you folks and others and say, we, we need to be more intelligent about use of these chemicals. Uh, moving right along. So we talked about water, Quality, now I move on to water quantity. Uh, and things, you know, not only the volume of water in a stream, but how it changes over time. Uh, so you pump a lot of water in the state. This weighted dot map shows the larger the dot, the higher the pumping capacity of those individual wells. And, you know, the central sands area is known for high vegetable crop production. Sandy soils don't hold the water, so they do a lot of pumping. But just to give you a feel for where we're using water across the state, uh, groundwater across the state. And when we draw water from these aquifers, that's less water for our wetlands, uh, lakes, and streams. Uh, so this is a pretty old study, probably 15, maybe even going on 20 years old, but this was the Little Plover River near uh, Stevens Point. And because of municipal and agricultural pumping, they literally sucked the stream dry. So we had a couple of UW Stevens Point graduate students that were uh, uh, sinking some piezometers or observation wells to track where the water table was at. Uh, so again, at one point, and the story has changed, thankfully, it's it now flows uh, perennially, but you know, at one point, uh, we had a little fishy swimming around and little freshwater shrimp scuttling about and uh, caddisflies, whatever, and now we have plants growing when we over pump from our uh, from our streams and rivers, or from that aquifer that feeds those streams and rivers. Another example from Cook Creek, which is in Vernon County, near Viroqua, where what you can't see in the photograph here is off to the right is Highway 56, but on the other side of the Highway 56 is a gravel, uh, gravel quarry and with a high cap well turned off. And this is what the stream looks like when the quarry turned on their pumps. So we got another issue. This one's been corrected as well. The uh, DNR has been wor worked with the land or the company to uh, be a little more intelligent about their pumping practices. Uh, Wilson Park Creek in Milwaukee, again, an uh, urban watershed with lots of concrete. Uh, so we've got uh, surface runoff goes into the storm drains and into the nearby streams. So we've got a bunch of trash in the stream up here or in, uh, in the vegetation along the stream. How did that get up there? Uh, perhaps little trash gremlins come out at night when we're sleeping, stuff trash up there to be uh, sinister. I'm not certain. Anyway, so the water is you know, roughly ankle deep right now, but after storm events, it goes from ankle deep upwards to 10, 12 feet deep. So if you're a little mud minnow or creek chub or whatever, this is a pretty harsh environment uh, to live in because of the flow alteration. So not surprisingly, uh, when we do fish surveys of these types of urban streams, we tend to find very few species uh, and those that are there are very environmentally tolerant. We tend to have low fish biomass because it just it's a harsh environment. Uh, many fish species and other aquatic animals get environmental cues from the flow of water in the springtime. When we have snowfall, there's uh, during snow melt, there's more water entering the streams and rivers. 
increases the water velocity and volume, and that's an environmental cue to many fish species to move upstream to spawn, with a long nose sucker being a case in point. Uh, moving on to stream connectivity, another major determinant of stream health. Uh, and an offer that uh, for both uh, roads and rivers to function, they need to be connected. Now you could hire a, an economist and they could with a pot of coffee and maybe a day's worth of work could make some kind of estimates of what economic function was lost because of this discontinuity. But uh, it's much more challenging uh, when we try to figure, about, figure out what uh, river and stream fragmentation impacts there are on the environment. Uh, again, as you can read here in the state, we have about uh, nearly 4,000 dams in the state and they fragment our larger rivers and many of our smaller streams. Uh, so the question is, why did the fish cross the road? Uh, so it's not a, just an issue with uh, dams, but uh, culverts are a big problem as well. Uh, and we have a mere 80,000 culverts in the state of Wisconsin. That's probably a lowball estimate. Again, where streams and roads intersect is where they put in culverts or bridges. And uh, this culvert was set kind of high on the, above the stream bed. So this creates a jump barrier for fish trying to move upstream to spawn. Again, if you're a little... A uh, small trout or a model sculpin or whatever, this is going to be quite a challenge. Even if you could make this jump, do you have the strength to swim up 30 feet up that pipe to get to the other side? Uh, so again, many barriers on the landscape that we hadn't really recognized until maybe last 10, 15 years. Uh, so a case in point, we've got uh, Ma Brook Trout desperately wants to move upstream to spawn in its natal spawning area, but because uh, this pipe was set too high on the landscape, creates a, a both a behavior, behavioral barrier and a physical barrier. Again, this fish might not be able to swim up through the shallow water. And they're also very leery about moving up through shallow water because they're going to be much more prone to uh, pred you know, predators like raccoons or mink or otters, whatever. So the point is, we when we fragment our streams, we really impact the uh, ecological integrity and the productivity of our uh, streams and you know fish populations. Moving on to habitat relatively healthy stream with the downside that uh, it's kind of inundated with reed canary grass, but we've got riffle areas, we've got deep pool habitat, shallow waters, uh, you know, vegetative habitat for fish and invertebrates. So relatively heterogeneous environment. A uh, term that ecologists use called ecotones. Anytime two distinctly different environments butt up against one another, you can think of a forest and a prairie, or in this case, the a stream or river in the river bank or the bottom of the stream called the hyporheic zone. Hypo meaning below, rheic meaning flowing water. You know, uh, as ca casual ver uh, observers of the streams, we'll, you know, look at the fish and frogs and the, you know, water striders, and that's all well and good. But if we're uh, uh, concerned about the biological functioning of our uh, water bodies, we need to think about these land water interfaces. Again, if we weighed and counted all the animals that lived at this land water interface over here or in the water here in the uh, benthic interface here, there's many more species, much more biomass in these environments uh, than in the wa water body itself. So if the, we're concerned about the functioning of these water bodies, we need to protect the riparian corridors and you know don't cover the stream bed with concrete or silt. Uh, and fortunately, we have ditched a lot of the streams in the state. It accelerates the movement of water off the crop fields. So the farmer's gonna get in and plant crops sooner, that sort of thing. But uh, in this stream, Halfway Prairie Creek, I've done some surveys on, you know, I could go from here up to 300 meters upstream and maybe see two different fish species when in fact sh hold, should hold maybe like uh, 10 or 15. Again, very monotypic, uh, water depth's the same, little overhead cover. Uh, again, just a uh, 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 very homogeneous environment that's not particularly productive. And you can take that to an even uh, worse case scenario of uh, when we line the channels of our st uh, streams with concrete. Uh, so the uh, city of Milwaukee is sub subsequently spending millions of dollars to break, take out all this concrete and re the channel, not because they're suddenly becoming environmental stewards, but it's thought that it's a, a better way to control flooding impacts. Uh, I forget the name of this creek. It's near Wildcat Mar uh, Mountain State Park in, in uh, Vernon County. Uh, so we got these logs and branches sticking out of the stream bank. What's going on there? Well, again, this is all this soil that was up on the upland slopes at one point. Again, they came in and cut down the 
you know, they cut down the forest and uh, all the trash or slash you left on the landscape migrated down slope into the valley bottoms along with all this topsoil. So it's taken this stream and hundreds, if not thousands like it across the state, well over a hundred years to cut back down through all this uh, sediment from that used to be in the uplands uh, down back to its historic stream channel. Uh, so which side of the fence were the cattle on, I wonder? Hmm. Uh, so again, we have this loss of habitat. So now the DNR goes in and uh, puts back habitat that uh, we've taken out or, or uh, covered with silt. Uh, moving on to the energy relationships or food chains. Uh, again, you, you know, you go back to your eighth grade biology class, you know that sunlight falls on green plants and the green plants are eaten by grasshoppers and the grasshopper gets eaten by a mouse and the great horned owl eats the mouse. That's the terrestrial food chain in our aquatic environments. Uh, sunlight's still important, but another factor, uh, this leaf litter, also known as alloctonous inputs, organic matter washing into the stream is a key energy source, particularly for our headwater streams that are shaded uh, by streamside vegetation. Uh, so again, the vegetation falls in the river, uh, the chemicals that prevent insects from feeding on it when they're on the leaves, when the leaves are on the trees or shrubs get washed out. Uh, these leaves get colonized by a biofilm, so it becomes like a cracker with peanut butter on it, a very nutrient food source for these larval stoneflies, the giant stoneflies or pteranarsids. Uh, again, these pteranarsids and other shredders, they're known as shredders, it's they do for a living, they're sloppy eaters, so a lot of that organic matter that they shred up flows downstream and with other animals like this net spinning caddisfly, they're close relatives to uh, moths and they have a silk gland, so they spin this little web. That's about the size of the, the kind of tip of your pinky, but nearly every healthy stream in the state has these net spinning caddisflies. Uh, again, they're the base of the food chain. For many of the streams that I study, they represent about 30% of the invertebrate biomass. So if for some reason we lose these net spinning caddisflies, say goodbye to 30% of the fish biomass, 30% of the mink biomass, 30% of the kingfisher biomass, so on and so forth up the food chain. So these little guys are kind of drab fellows, they're about an inch long and they got a Latin name that's about two inches long. So who cares about these crummy little caddisflies? But can rest assured they're the base of the food chain and fundamentally important. Uh, so again, uh, those issues uh, get transmitted up the food chain and usually it's at this point when we start seeing a loss of game fish when citizens become concerned when in fact we should uh, be thinking much lower down in the food chain if we're concerned about uh, the health of our uh, streams and rivers. Uh, again, excess nutrients can alter the food chains as well. Again, each all surfaces in the bottoms of our streams and rivers that receive sunlight have a biofilm and many invertebrates like this mayfly, they're kind of the cause of our streams that graze on the stream bottom. So if we alter that food chain, we say goodbye to these mayflies, another key link in the food chain. Again, when we see excess nutrients, we see more filamentous algae growth and it's a poor source of uh, food for those invertebrates. And uh, this is kind of an extreme example, but again, we see a shift in the key foods to this filamentous algae that's uh, less useful by the invertebrates. And we see the same issue in, in lakes as well. And again, with these algal blooms and the, the location of these blooms on the lake right now, Madison Lakes is more of a function of the wind directions uh, when this photograph was taken versus some pollution source. But again, rest, uh, recognize that eutrophication, I uh, see is most of your well aware impacts the food chains in our lake systems as well. Uh, quickly, if you look at a healthy stream, uh, you see this kind of distribution of different invertebrates. Uh, again, we've got mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, uh, not super productive necessarily in a healthy stream. And then we had uh, some other species. We, uh, and this image is, I thought, at least some of them are very tolerant of environmental degradation, but then we move on to an enriched stream and we may still have those same species, but we tend to have more of them because we've uh, energized the stream with excess nutrients. But we uh, then start to see some shifts in the different species found in the streams and rivers. And we tend to pick up more tolerant species denoted by the red circles. And then they have very really highly disturbed watershed. We tend to see a loss of invertebrate biomass, very few of those sensitive species and more of a preponderance of uh, more tolerant species. Uh, some BMP, so if you can hang in, bear with me for like two more minutes, this is all painfully obvious to you folks, but again, things like uh, minimum till plowing where we keep uh, vegetation on the landscape after the crops have been harvested. Again, it dissipates the energy from rainfall, raindrops on the soil and holds the soil in place. 
uh, things like cover crops where again, uh, it's a BMP, the uh, ag producers benefit and the aquatic resources benefit. And in the case of cover crops, you can see some of the benefits that the landowners acc accrue. I mean, things like strip and contour cropping instead of plowing up and down the hillsides, mm -hmm. Uh, which promotes runoff, uh, do it on a contour. And if you have strip crops, when a uh, producer harvests the corn, they still have the alfalfa in place to keep the uh, soil on the landscape. Uh, keeping the manure in the barnyards versus running off site. Again, historically, this holds true less now with CAFOs, but in the past, taking that manure and spreading on your fields was beneficial to the landowners. Now that we have these large herd operations, it's become more of a waste source. So it's it's probably less of a BMP these days, for uh, with the exception of the, the smaller farmers. Uh, again, stormwater detention, not letting that water flow directly in the stream, but at least filtering out some of the solids that before it does enter the surface waters. And better yet, having infiltration basins where, again, this was just planted with some uh, uh, plant species uh, like a week before this photograph was taken, but again, the water will come off a rooftop from a building, flow into this rain garden and infiltrate into the ground versus running off as warm, polluted water. Uh, rotational grazing, instead of having the cattle graze a uh, pasture down to bare soil where the manure and soil runs off, rotating the cattle keeps vegetative cover and the livestock benefit because they have a better food source. Uh, just one example, Trout Creek in Buffalo County, a study I worked on many years ago. Uh, Trout Creek didn't have any trout in it at the time because of overgrazing and turbidity and warming water and siltation. So the cost of a single strand electric fence, this is what Trout Creek looked like one year later. So again, the vegetation is encroaching on the stream, providing shading, keeping the stream cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter, uh, increasing water velocity, which uh, uh, scours out the accumulated sediment. So lo and behold, Trout Creek now has trout in it because it, there's some tributaries that were refuges for trout and they redistributed themselves in the main stem. So for the cost of a single strand electric fence, uh, Mother Nature is quite resilient and uh, can restore herself. Uh, so uh, quickly, uh, kind of my pet peeve at DNR, we always talk about water quality and certainly water quality is fundamentally important, but hopefully after this brief presentation, you have a feel for uh, some other factors we need to think about if we're concerned about the health of our flowing waters. Uh, so again, preaching to the choir here, uh, so I can breeze through this pretty quickly. Uh, so I apologize for bumbling on the front end with uh, loading my presentation. I suspect that, that would happen. Uh, uh, but if there's time for questions, I realize we're run, bumping up against the hour. So I'll turn it over to Paul to see how he wants to orchestrate the rest of the presentation. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we do have two, well, three questions in the chat. Well, two, uh, two in a comment, I guess. We are right up against one o'clock, uh, but we have about 70 people hanging on here. So, um, Mike, if you have a few minutes, we can take uh, the questions that are in the chat. I certainly do. Thanks for okay. the questions. All right. So those two questions are both related to climate change. Uh, the first one being, how do you expect climate change to affect private wells and groundwater recharge in the northern counties? Hmm. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're seeing an increase in uh, storm frequencies and intensities. Uh, so is, is that going to equate to uh, greater recharge? Uh, not 100% certain. We're also seeing that, uh, well, frankly, painfully this year, we're seeing much less of a snowpack this year. Again, I'm not a hydrologist, so I'm definitely on the fringe of my knowledge. So I'll keep this brief just because I'm because uh, I don't have any great answers, frankly, but uh, snowpack, loss of snowpack is going to be fundamentally important. Uh, much more of that water tends to infiltrate into the water table, or excuse me, the aquifer than, uh, than uh, say, rainfall events. So, I, so the point is, I think climate change could have some fairly, frankly, profound effects on uh, aquifer recharge. So, but again, that's it's on the fringe of my knowledge, and I'll leave it at that. And sorry, I don't have a better answer. Okay, the other two uh, questions here are relating to fish and climate change. Um, basically asking how how is water temperature going to change and affect fish, fish distribution, including maybe turning a, a river that's currently healthy with a good trout population into a different trout, uh, different fish community, or maybe a fishless river? 
Right. Okay. So, yeah, you know, well, obviously, this climate change issue is very uh, disconcerting, but there's been some great modeling work done in, in the state by Wisconsin DNR staff that uh, where they've mapped all the current distributions of brook trout and brown trout in the state. And we know that, uh, I don't know the exact breakpoint temperature-wise, but brook trout need colder water than brown trout. Uh, so what we're going to see is over time, a loss, uh, continued loss of uh, brook trout habitat, and there'll be some replacement by brown trout moving into those colder waters. Uh, but then at some point, frankly, the brown trout are going to bump up against this thermal maxima, and we're going to start uh, seeing a loss of uh, brown trout as well, and, and perhaps those would be replaced by smallmouth bass. So again, the uh, predictions are not uh, are not good, uh, but I, I think we have some pretty good data to show this uh, spatial extent of that. And there's some areas of the states because of extremely strong base flow that there'll be uh, kind of refuge areas uh, that we need to protect uh, to maintain populations as long as we uh, can. But if we don't uh, reverse the uh, uptick in temperatures, it's it's uh, not looking promising for brook and brown trout. Okay, thanks, Mike. There is one more question that just came in um, about how you measure neonicotinoid concentrations in the water. Sure. So uh, the way I do it is I go out to a stream and I take a syringe, have a little filter on it, take a 20 mils of water and uh, run it through this filter on that's on the tip of the syringe and put it in a little glass vial and freeze that and ship it off to the lab. And uh, they have a, it's called a, well, not to get weeds on this, but anyways, the instrumentation they use a, a mass spectrometer can measure these chemicals to the parts per trillion level. Again, we can take it down to like two parts per trillion. Uh, so very low uh, concentrations, but again, what we're seeing effects at low concentrations as well. So and those analytical costs are anywhere from like 50 bucks to uh, $100 per sample. So it's kind of, it's one reason we don't necessarily have great pesticide data in the state because the expensive undertaking to do these types of analyses. Okay. There is one more question that came in uh, asking coming, how, can we, how can we help you spread the knowledge and these, these best management practices that you presented about? Okay, well, how does one do that? I mean, obviously becoming more knowledgeable, how, how do we spread the word? I mean, I think the agricultural community is, you know, well aware of some of these practices. I, you know, frankly, I think it's, I think it's, I think the limitation here is frankly our, our legislature. I think they tend, tend to be pretty hands off as far as any type of, uh, regulations as it comes to better managing the landscape. So I, frankly, I think we need to press our legislators if we're, uh, uh, if we, I think we need to have better enforcement of our laws that are on the books right now. Uh, again, I just, uh, yeah, uh, talk to your legislature, uh, legislators and see what they're doing or not doing and don't let them off the hook too easy if they give you some bad answer. I guess I'm not supposed to be advocating politically for the environment, but here I am. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so we do have one more question again that came in as you were answering that one. Uh, do you think there's an area of the country that you think will handle climate change's effects on surface waters better than our Great Lakes region? Uh, Frank, I think the Great Lakes region, even though I've offered some kind of grim predictions, is one of the better areas of the country. I think the Northeast, uh, and I, I don't know if we're seeing this now, but the Northeast, I think is going to be more challenged with a much more intense rainfall events and, and storm intensities. So that's going to be very pro uh, problematic, I believe. And again, there's some good models out there. And I think uh, the, the modeling that's been to date is kind of uh, shown to be coming true as far as uh, predictions. Uh, so as I think that uh, West is, you know, uh, many of the arid states are going to become more so uh, again, we're certainly going to see changes in whether it's rainfall or snow melt. And I, my dim recollection is I think we might see like a 30% increase in overall precip in the upper Midwest. But it, again, uh, I think other parts of this country are going to be worse off than we are. So, um, so that's the kind of my dim understanding of the geographic dif uh, differences. Okay. Well, we sure appreciate your time today, Mike. Thanks a lot for the presentation.
Uh, I just want to mention a quick reminder about the last talk in our winter water talk series for this year is on March 5th. It is talking about our wacky weather of Wisconsin with the weather guys, uh, Jonathan Martin and Steve Ackerman from UW-Madison. So we'll send out a reminder about that if you haven't registered for it already. Otherwise, uh, have a great day and we hope to see you back here in March. I appreciate the opportunity. If anyone has questions, again, my email is Michael A, one word, dot Miller, M I L L E R, at Wisconsin, the entire word, dot G O V. And I know the weather guys will are, do a much better job of describing our future than I tried to just now. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thank you, Paul.